I'm Angino. Welcome to the Mangino Talks Pittsburgh podcast. I've been a radio talk show host for half of my life and nearly half of that in Pittsburgh. And so my podcast, we talk about everything that matters to us all, from current events to Pittsburgh history, social issues to sports, politics to practical day-to-day life. And there's a story that occurred back when Taylor Swift was in town. Major news event for her to be here, but there was another story in the sports world that has an indirect impact on so many of us. And it was Coach Huggins from West Virginia University that was pulled over and arrested for DUI. He was drinking at nearly three times the legal limit, and that's how he was driving. The police officers caught him doing this. And he subsequently said that he was willing to go to rehab if he could keep his job at West Virginia. West Virginia declined that and then forced him into a resignation, if you will. His daughter put out a very loving, supporting, compassionate statement regarding him and saying that, you know what, he doesn't have a drinking problem. He's not an alcoholic. He just drinks like upwards of 90% of us drink. And then I came across another sobering statistic, sobering intended, is that we lost 110,000 people to drug overdoses in the course of the past year. But what most people are not paying attention to any longer because of the fentanyl crisis that we clearly are in is that the CDC says that we are losing about 140,000 people every year to alcohol, whether it's alcohol related accidents, alcohol poisoning, uh, alcohol causing other health ailments to us. And we need to be addressing this and not take our eyes off the idea that yes, fentanyl is terrible, but we can't look at, the, at alcohol as though it's not significant. It's not as important. It's almost okay if you have some aspect of a drinking problem. And so I'm turning now to the expert in Southwestern Pennsylvania that I turn to every single time. His name is Dr. Tom Brophy. He is with Geyser Center. Uh, they specialize in addiction. He is board certified in addiction medicine. And doctor, welcome to Mangino Talks. Wonderful to have you on. Thank you, sir. It's an honor to be on your podcast. This issue of alcoholism, uh, alcohol-related deaths, are you, are you concerned at all, as I just expressed, that we are so focused on fentanyl, justifiably so, that we're almost not paying the proper level of attention to the concerns regarding alcohol as an abusive drug? I'm massively concerned, and, and and I'm not just saying that for dramatic purposes. I mean, I can give specific examples, but since the COVID pandemic hit and we had so many people change the way that they do their day-to-day routine, and, and, and suddenly so many more people are, are working from home, um, what, you know, they're, they're, they're shut in for short periods of time. There's even, you know, the depression and anxiety of what's going on globally with the pandemic itself. We have seen a steady increase in alcohol consumption since that time. I mean, if, I don't know if you remember what was going on with the economy, but almost everything was crashing econ- economically because of the shutdown. But alcohol sales were not. They were steadily climbing. And 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 we still haven't even seen the full picture of that. I mean, we we have we have more and more people overdosing. And and you know, the, we often think of drugs like, oh, opioids and fentanyl and 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 you know, even even Xanax and cocaine and things like that. But alcohol is socially acceptable. And and so even seeing that statement from Coach Huggins' family, it, you know, it's clear that. People often in their minds, they have a picture, a, a, a stigma, if you will, of what they think alcoholism looks like, but that's not the whole picture. There, there's a spectrum of alcohol use and abuse, and, um, and and it gets complicated for people because they turn on the TV and they see advertisements. They go to a sporting event and they see posters and specials, and, and, and it is very much socially acceptable despite the destruction that we know it causes, you know, the, not, and not just to the individual but to the entire family, to the community, you know, I, I mean, alcohol is, it's a drug. People become chemically dependent on it like they do any other drug. And, and people, you know, they, they, it alters their consciousness and causes them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And, and what's most scary to me about the alcohol use problem is it's massively underreported. You know, I mean, we, we only know about the cases that result in legal consequences or, or, you know, some medical pathology developing, but there are so many people who, you know, they're just drinking at home, um, you know, 
maybe even every day whenever they get home from work. And, 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 and it's just, you know, they're not aware of, of the health problems that are starting to accumulate. They're not aware of how that addiction is progressing and getting worse and worse. And, and so, you know, it's one of the, uh, of all of the addictions, I believe that alcohol is the one that is the most underreported because people don't like to a- admit that it's causing problems in their life. And, um, and it's only reported, you know, in, in certain conditions where somebody enters treatment or when somebody gets in, you know, some kind of legal consequence. Doctor, you are not treating Coach Huggins, and I want to make this clear, so I don't want to necessarily speak to the particulars of his case. However, let's take another individual who is caught DUI at nearly three times the legal limit and then is willing to go to rehab in an effort supposedly to, 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 to save a job. If this was really an incident of a one in a million chance of getting caught DUI, and this is not how they anybody normally drinks alcohol, is going to rehab necessary? So when you talk about going to rehab, first, you know, we have to understand that there's all sorts of different levels of rehab. You know, there, there's the high intensity inpatient residential treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then there's all the way down, you know, to uh, IOP, which is intensive outpatient, meaning like they're not staying overnight at a facility, but they're still going into a facility for treatment between three and five days a week. Um, and, and, and then there's all the way down, you know, to, to, to outpatient treatment, which can even consist of, you know, seeing their primary care doctor, taking some medications to help them reduce their alcohol cravings and, and maybe getting counseling once a month. And, and so that's a, it's a big spectrum, you know, of, of treatment. And, um, you know, when, when we talk about who needs treatment, what we do is we look at the DSM criteria for alcohol use disorder. And this is something that continues to change and evolve over time based on what we're seeing. So, you know, with, with Coach Huggins' family member, um, you know, it, it, it becomes very clear that there is that misunderstanding. And what I mean by that is, you know, by her saying, you know, well, well he just drinks like 90% of us drink. 90% of the American population does not drink to the point that, you know, they're, they're blacking out, they're in a city that they don't know where they are, and, and you know, they, they, they can't function and, and operate a motor vehicle. You can say that, you know, maybe upwards of over 50% of the population has experienced problematic drinking in that way. Um, but it's, you know, which, what, what that person is doing is they're associating alcoholism with a certain image that they have in their head. Somebody who drinks every day from the time they wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, until they go to bed, somebody who, if they, if they stop drinking, they're going to have seizures and, and somebody who, you know, it, they're, they're either red in the face all the time or, or they're, you know, they're shaking in tremors because they need that first, that first drink of alcohol. And, and that, that's certainly one of the more severe forms of alcohol use disorder. Um, but what the DSM has done as far as modify and evolve over time is they used to have a completely separate category that was just called problematic drinking. And and this was, you know, whether it be a college kid or or a young adult, you know, who who drank on the weekends and binged until they blacked out or somebody who got a DUI, somebody who had a consequence, um, whether it be legal ramifications, um, professional job place, you know, ramifications, maybe, maybe some disruption within the family but it was these isolated incidences. Well, they call that alcohol use, uh, like problem drinking, um, but it wasn't quite yet alcohol use disorder. And what we now know, what we understand much better as we continue to focus on addiction and learning about addiction is, is that it, it's a spectrum. And, and that's usually often how it starts before it develops into that full chemical dependence where a person you know, can't go 12 to 24 hours without putting alcohol in their system. For everyone who's listening right now, how can they make a proper self-assessment that they're having an alcohol problem? My guess is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the very first step to getting help with your problem is admitting that you have one. If you never admit that you have one, then you're never going to go seek the help and follow through on it. So help us self-diagnose. We have an issue if. That's, that, that's a great question. And, um, and, and to touch on a couple of things is yes, no matter how much you want somebody to acknowledge that they have a problem, unless they are in that appropriate phase of change, we talk about the phases of change as sort of a cycle of decision making from pre contemplation, meaning I don't have a problem to contemplation, which is okay, maybe I have a problem. And, and, and you go all the way around, you know, to, to, um, you know, preparation, action, maintenance. And, and, and at any point, you know, 
that person can come on and off that circle. But when they're in that pre-contemplation phase where they're not even willing to acknowledge that they have a problem, you're not going to make much progress, you know, trying to get that person into treatment because if they do go into treatment, they're only going to do it to appease the people around them. The, the bottom line, I tell people this whenever I do a lot of the, uh, the lectures at local, you know, high schools and colleges, and I'm talking about substance abuse. When, when somebody wants to know if they have an addiction, and, and, and we can actually put this across the board, whether we're talking about, you know, somebody um, who, who uh, you know, uses alcohol, uh, tobacco, or even if it's, you know, a behavioral addiction, it's something like, um, you know, uh, pornography or, or, you know, uh, shopping on the internet. All of the questions that we go through whether we're using, you know, the cage criteria, the BARC-10, the ASAM placement criteria, we have all these resources that we can kind of plug the answers to those questions in and see how far along that spectrum is that person, if they even have a problem at all. But the questions are all aimed at, it has it become a destructive element in your life. And, and a lot of people think like, oh, well, I, I didn't get arrested. And, and um, you know, so I, I don't have any legal trouble over it. I didn't lose my job over it. But there's all sorts of questions that, that, that try and nail down whether or not it's a destructive element in your life. For, for example, are your loved ones concerned that you're doing too much of it? Um, you know, have you lost friendship or, or um, social relationships because of it? Have you showed up to work late because of it or unnecessary call offs? You know, and, and you know, is it is it impacting you financially in a negative way? If you buy two packs of cigarettes a day, that's impacting you negatively in a financial way, whether you want to believe it or not. If you end up in the hospital because of bronchitis once a year because of your smoking, that's impacting your health negatively. So, you know, that all of the questions are, is it a destructive element? And when we get to some of the more soft drugs, you know, things like caffeine, you know, most people can answer like, well, no, you know, I, I mean, it, it's, I don't need my Starbucks. I, you know, I, I don't need to spend and, and, and I can easily take breaks from it and, and all those sorts of things. Then it's certainly less concerning, you know, from an addiction standpoint. But anybody who, anybody who has had a DUI, has had serious legal consequences and serious financial consequences because of their substance use. Therefore, they they may be you know early on in that in that spectrum of alcohol use disorder, but they're on that spectrum and they do meet the criteria for treatment. And then the next thing you do is you determine the severity of their condition and you use what's called the ASAM placement criteria. ASAM stands for the American Society of Addiction Medicine of which I am a, a fellow as are, you know, many of my colleagues. And, um, and, 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 and finally, you know, this is something that's new as of like 2016. Finally, everything is getting standardized and kind of put together under the American Society of Addiction Medicine so that whether you're being treated in Pennsylvania or you're being treated in California, as long as that medical facility is following the ASAM placement guides um, and treatment guidelines, you know you're going to, you know, basically get a, the, the same approach. Let's talk about family members. There is no doubt in my mind that family members like Coach Huggins has tremendous love for this man. For sure. And, but at the same time, I'm wondering, is it possible that in our love for those that are around us that are suffering with addiction, that we are enabling and not even realizing it in some circumstances? And to what extent... Do we have to acknowledge that that individual has a problem that needs to be addressed for us to be able to properly help them as well? It's it's huge. I, I mean, I, I dealt with this in my own family. You know, um, I, I have a sibling who went very deep down that rabbit hole of substance abuse, and 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 my own mom, who's a nurse practitioner who, who has medical knowledge and information. Um, by the way, she now works in addiction treatment as well because of the experiences that she went through and the things that she learned. But for the longest time, she was enabling in ways that she didn't really see as enabling. And I'll give an example, you know, like if he couldn't pay his rent, well, he would call and cry and say, I, I can't pay my rent. I can't pay the electrical bill. It's winter. You know, like I I'm going to suffer. And she would step up and pay that rent and pay that electrical bill and think like, well, I'm not giving him cash to spend on, you know, his drug of choice. Uh, therefore, I, I'm not enabling. But what she didn't realize is what that's doing is, you know, he may have had $200 saved that he scraped together to pay that electrical bill or, or you know, to keep that power on. Well, now that money is freed up to use to the for the drug. 
because the rent is taken care of or because the bill is taken care of. And there are so many different forms of enabling like that that people just don't realize. They think that they're just supporting the person or, or even in some cases that they're preventing them from sliding any further down you know, that slope when really they, they just don't realize that they actually are enabling that addiction. And, and we do have resources like Al-Anon and, and, and different you know, online programs where people can go and learn about the right way to support a family member, um, which I often tell people that come to the addiction treatment facilities, you know, the right way to support somebody is say like, listen, you, you have a problem that, that, that I recognize as destructive and, and I don't want to enable that problem. I love you. I, I, you, you can always come and talk to me. I will always help drive you to treatment. I will always help, you know, be there by your side while we learn more about this disease and, and, and this addiction. Um, but where, where you're helping them out financially, where you're helping facilitate them getting the product. Um, and, and there are very subtle ways that a lot of people don't realize, you know, when somebody goes down that rabbit hole of addiction, part of the, the, the neuroplasticity that's developing in their brain is they're getting better and better at acquiring that substance with very limited resources. Yeah. And, and what we don't realize is that they also, they get better and better at manipulation. They get better and better at recognizing what the people around them need to hear in order for that to facilitate them. It, 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 it's, it's monstrous, it's destructive. But that's why it's that's why treatment is, is such a a commitment, you know, it, it, that you're not going to reverse that neuroplasticity and those brain changes in 30 days. It takes a long time. It and, sounds and as though family members need to go to therapy as well. 100 percent need help to be able to help the loved one along the process. It's not just that individual has a problem. They have to go and get help. The whole family has to go that's and right. get help. That's right. You mentioned the issue of enabling. And I know there are people who are listening right now that are thinking this, and I'm going to ask it. Is our effort on a scale collectively in our society from a government and an addiction issue, uh, are we enabling people to use drugs and to continue to use drugs if we give them safe havens, if we give them places to inject? If we give them clean needles, if we do what we can to have even shelters of some kind where there aren't real strict security measures to ensure that those things are not coming into facilities, is it possible that even we as our society are trying to do the very best that we can in loving these people and wanting them to be better? Are we enabling? So the, there's there's enabling and, and then there are things like harm reduction, you know, and, and harm reduction is recognizing that like this person is going to do this drug, like they, they're in a deep state of addiction where their, their limbic system is driving them to use that drug. And it's bypassing that prefrontal cortex, the smart parts of our brain. And, and if, if they're going to use that drug, then at least provide clean needles so that they're not, um, you know, sharing needles that are infected with hepatitis C or HIV. And, you know, let, let's, let's at least have them doing their drug in a place where they can receive Narcan and be res resuscitated. And that's not enabling that, it, that that's called harm reduction. But as a society, do we enable 100%? I mean, if you just watch a sporting event, I can't watch a sporting event without seeing 10 commercials from Anheuser-Busch and, and another 10 commercials for, for DraftKings gambling, you know, and, and, and gambling is one of these things that in, in our almighty greed and in, in, in our in our seeking the almighty dollar, we have relaxed a lot of restrictions and, and, and said like, well, if people are going to do this, then, you know, the county, the state, uh, the, the, the federal government might as well be getting some tax revenue um, a, a, as a part of it. But that doesn't mean it's healthy. That doesn't, you know, the, it, with gambling, I mean, it, it's simply a matter of mathematics and statistics. Like the house always wins, right? That's why, you know, capitalistic um, entrepreneurs, you know, are, are drawn to it because the mathematics alone tells you that like the house is always going to win, that the odds are always stacked against the player. Yet we like that. We like the enjoyment we get from it. We like the dopamine hit we get from it. So even from lottery scratch offs, I mean, I see people that we treat with addiction and we get them off the chemical substances. And then I stop at the local gas station and they'll buy one scratch off from the machine and scratch them all off. And five minutes later, they'll be putting another 20, 50, a hundred dollars into the scratch off machine to get more. I mean, that's addiction. It's the dopamine hit 
and 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 they're looking for that dopamine hit and and as a society we you know we we play these games where it's like well don't do it once you get to this degree of, of disease and severity um but as long as you know you're doing it and spending money and 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 it's not you know destroying your whole life we'll put a little commercial line at the end that says oh and if you do have a gambling problem call this number you know the people that are going out and and embracing those activities for those dopamine hits they're shutting off that last little bit they're you know they're they're not listening to that last little bit because they're convincing themselves that's part of addiction the psychology yeah. of addiction is you convince yourself that you're in control that you don't have as big of a problem as everybody else does and and that's that limbic system tricking the brain tricking the smart part of the brain to continue embracing that activity because it results in the dopamine hit do we have to address the issue at a core that we have an addiction problem and that it just manifests itself in alcohol, other drugs, uh, gambling, smoking, that the real issue is not those substances. It's what's within us that is chasing that maybe dopamine hit you're talking about. Yes. And I'll give you a perfect example of how badly we're doing at that. Um, I, I go to, the, you know, as, as you know, I go to a lot of the local high schools and they pack the auditorium with these kids. And we, by the way, we get a great response from these kids because we tell them the truth. We show them the neuroscience and we basically say, like, look, this is what happens each time you use one of these substances. You, you may be genetically predisposed to go down that slippery slide a lot further than the people around you. So use the science to make good decisions. You know, we're not just standing up there saying, you know, don't do drugs, shame on you. We're saying experimentation and, and trying different things to see what you like and don't like is part of the human experience. However, this is the science behind it. And, and we get a great response when we do these talks. But what I always acknowledge and what I always point out is that 10 to 15 minutes into that talk, these kids are reaching in their pockets. You know, they're pulling out their cell phones. You know, they're going through it. And, and by the way, I never hesitate to remind them that all of these apps that we use, all, you know, whether it be Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, they're all built. Even the phone itself is built on the science of addiction. They know exactly how long your brain needs to pay attention to get that dopamine hit and exactly how long it's going to be between your board and you're looking for that next dopamine hit. And, and even the people who built these products don't let their own children use them because they know if anybody doubts that, go watch the 60 Minutes expose that they did. Uh, there's another one on, on Netflix called The Social Dilemma that talks all about the, the, the science of addiction that was used in the development of these products. So not only do we do a very poor job of acknowledging serious things like somebody driving a vehicle and having no idea what city they're in and, and potentially jumping a curb and killing you know a, a, an innocent bystander, but we allow that that addiction neuroscience and, and that addictive process into our homes, into our teenagers' brains. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a very complex thing because it brings a lot of benefits into our life, but it also brings about that addiction process, that always looking for that dopamine hit. And it's going to get worse. It's getting scary because we are embracing so many of these different elements outside the world of chemical substances because we think like, well, as long as they're not putting an addictive chemical in their body, they'll be fine. That That's proving to not be the case. We have kids who can't focus in class. We have kids who, you know, really what we have, if we want to be honest here, is we have a country of people who have lost the ability to regulate their emotions. And, and, and that loss of be, the ability to regulate our emotions results in the polarization and fighting that you see online. It results in, you know, a bad feelings from being bullied, uh, turning into a mass shooting. It, it results in a fender bender turning into road rage where somebody actually dies. And, and like all of these things are increasing in frequency and severity. Yet we're not acknowledging the fact that like we're all playing a role in that. And, and, and that's why I always say like addiction is a community problem. It's not the just the individual who has a problem and it's not just the family who now has a problem. It's, it, it's a community problem and, and it affects every level of that community. Now, is there a productive way, constructive way, beneficial way to go and get that dopamine hit or is the problem that we are too dependent on that dopamine hit in the first place. So people have to remember that our brains evolved for hundreds of thousands of years chasing that dopamine hit. But 
the dopamine came from different things back then, right? The dopamine came when, when you and your tribe, you know, killed the animal and now everybody was able to eat or, you know, you, you achieved that big goal of finally making it to that destination where now everybody is safer. The limbic system that drives addiction traditionally, I call it the caveman part of your brain, because when we think of caveman, we think of everything that they do is in pursuit of food, water, sex, shelter, safety. And, and that's what we know the limbic system is responsible for. When people have diseases or lesions in their limbic system, they no longer can, can pursue those things. The older parts of the brain, like the limbic system, will always overpower and, and, and sort of bypass the newer parts of the brain, like our prefrontal cortex, where all of our intelligence you know, comes from. And that's why even when you sit down and you talk to somebody who's struggling with addiction and you're, you're embracing that smart part of their brain, you know, the part that, that, that does complex reasoning and, and, and determining short-term consequences versus long-term gains, basically everything that a human can do that, a, that a, a non-human primate, ape, chimpanzee, gorilla, what they can't do is they can't have those complex thoughts about their environment. However, if your limbic system needs aren't being met, then the limbic system takes over. And the best example I can give people of that is, is, is you know, like I always have, you know, a bottle of water around or a Yeti with fluid around. And, and water is one of the most important things necessary to our survival. You can't go more than three days without water. But nobody thinks about my water when I take a sip of it. Nobody's, you know, focusing on my, my little bottle of Aquafina, you know, at, at the front of the auditorium. Because they're using the smart part of their brain, they're listening to my lecture because their limbic system needs have been met. However, if there was an earthquake and we all got trapped and, and stuck in that auditorium, within three days, they wouldn't be thinking about my lecture. They wouldn't be thinking about where they're going to go on vacation this summer. They would, be, they would literally plot my murder over my bottle of water. And that's a very real thing. And some of us, we, we, we've we gotten a small glimpse of that, right? Like if you've ever gone to the grocery store on an empty stomach versus going to the grocery store after you've just eaten a big meal, you make very different decisions, including how much money you spend, how much you load in your car, how, how long you spend in that grocery store. And, and whether and or not you're going to take out that old lady who's going for the food first. Exactly, right? And, and we even apply, you know, like comical terms to it, like, oh, she's just hangry or he's just hangry, you know, because we've all experienced just a small glimpse of that. But what's happening with addiction is these substances, this is not theoretical. Like we, we can tag these substances with a, a radioisotope and through functional MRI, we can follow exactly what part of the brain they go to and they all go to the limbic system. And, and so, you know, when a person says like, I want to stop doing that drug, I want to stop smoking that cigarette. I want to stop having that alcoholic drink. I want to stop putting that opioid in my body. In that moment, they're using their prefrontal cortex. But then when they go out into that community and that limbic system's needs aren't being met, it would be the same as you not picking up a bottle of water, having not had water for three days. Like you'll push everybody out of the way. You'll kill somebody for that bottle of water. And, and we can even go further than that. You know, if somebody is obsessing about my bottle of water, I always tell them, like, how could I get you to stop doing that? Well, I could take the oxygen out of the room because that would embrace an even early part of your brain, your brain stem, where oxygen hunger and, and the regulation of even more primal things, that's the reptilian brain that controls all of our vital signs, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our, our breathing and respiratory rate. And, and so, you know, there's this thing that I, I refer to as neuronal hierarchy that I'm always teaching people that that's part of the reason why these activities continue and, and, and why they'll always continue because our brains evolved all the way past the reptilian point mm -hmm. through all mammals have a limbic system. We're all mm -hmm. driven towards food, water, sex, shelter, safety from our environment, safety from predators. And when those needs are met, then we can use our prefrontal cortex. But when those needs are not met, we're not using our prefrontal cortex. And, and every dictator in the world knows this, right? Like every dictator takes away your food, water, sex, shape, safety, shelter, because you'll do whatever they say to get those needs met. And, and this is all neuroscience. And the more we understand about this neuroscience, the more we can navigate and mitigate all of these addiction problems that just continue to get piled on as we add in things like electronics and all these other dopamine hits, you know, that we're getting from outside the natural world. And, and, and we, you know, there's no putting that cat back in the bag, right? Like we have to learn to live with this. And therefore we have to understand how our own brains work how our family members' brains work, including those who struggle with addiction, and, and learn more about how to constructively support those people to get them better, to get their brain healing in the other direction. And, and that's, that's the big point, is that there's always hope. 
because our bodies and brains are so resilient. If, if, if we have people who could survive in a concentration camp for a decade and then live to 95 years old, you know, that shows you how much we can bounce back and how resilient our brains and bodies are. And the beauty of neuroplasticity is like we're learning that everything you expose your brain to, some of which you have control over and some of which you don't, but everything your brain experiences causes a slight change based on that, that experience. Well, that's where we have to get people in a controlled environment. When they're struggling with, with severe advanced stages of addiction, you have to get them in a controlled environment where you can at least control some of that external stimuli mm -hmm. and educate them so that when they get out there, they are also applying those same restrictions and healthy boundaries so that their brain is not being you know, continually exposed to it. Otherwise, it won't heal. The brain won't heal. One final thing. Give us the first step to getting the help from the person who is dealing with the addiction to the loved one who wants to make a difference in that person's life. Education and communication. You know, with the more people learn about it and learn about not enabling, but supporting somebody in a healthy manner, um, then the better that family, including the addict themselves, is, is more likely to do. I have people you know, auditoriums full of healthcare professionals. And I'll say, what do you think addiction? Is, is it a choice or is it a disease? And, th and they all say it's a disease. We can see it on brain scans. We know the neurophysiology and neuropathology. Like that's the definition of a disease. But if you ask a room full of addicts, they'll often say, I, I just make bad decisions. I don't know why. I, I don't want to make these bad decisions, but it seems like I just can't help it. I just, I get out there and I think I'm doing okay. And then I make a bad decision and, and teaching them the neuroscience of it is just as important because, you know, we have to teach them that that's that limbic system wanting that dopamine. And, and if they set these healthy boundaries and they continue down that pathway of treatment and recovery, that that signal, that, that, that behavioral signal telling your body to pick up that substance, like, it will improve over time. Your brain will heal and that, and that will get better. And, and education is always the great equalizer. You know, you can lift somebody up from poverty. You can lift somebody up from, you know, the lowest points of, of, of the globe through education and, and supporting them in, in a healthy way. And, uh, and, and I believe that that is also really, really important moving forward because listen, we don't even know the consequences of things like our, our devices and what, what's life going to look like 50 years from now, you know, how much of us are going to go, you know, further down that addiction pathway thinking that since we're not picking up a chemical substance, we'll be fine. But when you educate yourself on the neuroscience of addiction, you realize the importance of setting healthy boundaries. Okay. If I'm going to engage in that activity, I'm only going to do it for a short period of time. And if I can't maintain that boundary, then I need help. You know, then, then, and, and so that's where I tell a lot of people like set some healthy boundaries, even, even if you don't think you have an alcohol problem, okay, stop consuming alcohol for 90 days. If you don't have a problem, then you should be able to do that without any difficulty. I'm a big fan of things like sober October and, you know, things like that, because it's often an eye opening experience for somebody who, you know, maybe they, they smoke marijuana and they think marijuana is not addictive. Marijuana doesn't have a chemical dependence, but you could be addicted to anything. You could be addicted to picking your skin. You know, the, the question is, is, is it destructive? Has it become a destructive element in your life? And, um, and, and so I think educating people on that is massively important. And, and that's why I'm so appreciative of everything that you do. Doctor, thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you, sir. It was an honor. Right. Dr. Tom Brophy joining us. He is the executive director of the Geyser Center in Butler. He is board certified in addiction medicine and just absolutely fantastic. Love to go to him as a source. And thank you all for listening to the show. Please be sure to click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. For more on me and the show, be sure to visit ManginoTalks.com. If there is a topic you would like me to talk about or a guest that you would like to have on, then please send me an email, Mangino at ManginoTalks.com. Follow me on your favorite social media platform by using at Mangino Talks. And once you find me, please like, follow, subscribe, and share the pages with your friends and family. And thanks again for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast. I want to talk to you.